Well, there are a few things more pivotal and fascinating than questions and answers. And so whether it's philosophers, nations, or toddlers, in our conversations and our relationships, we're naturally looking for answers and who can supply the right ones. But in order for accurate answers to surface, someone has to ask the right questions. As we read the accounts of Jesus' interactions, we see him take the time to honor questions and address the longings and the misguided notions of the human heart. Today's text from the book of Luke finds Jesus' disciples in a dispute and not letting this teaching moment to escape Jesus engages with them. So as we continue our Sunday morning series, Jesus has something to say about that. We're going to hear Jesus' authoritative wisdom on the topic of true greatness. The gospel describes how in the swirl of opinions and ignorance and conflict, Jesus delivers the truth that we need. Let's go to him and ask him to deliver that to us today. Lord Jesus, you are the source of wisdom and truth and goodness and beauty and glory. We come to you for understanding. We come to you to be convicted, to know you better, to understand ourselves, and really how to relate to you and hear from you and receive from you, and then to honor and to obey you. Our desire, Lord Jesus, this morning is that in the quiet of this room, in the quiet of our hearts, we can set aside, uh, as we've been saying this morning, the distractions of life and really hear from your word. And Holy Spirit, please minister to us, give us uh, encouragement, and give us understanding that we need. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Well, we're going to turn to Luke 22 this morning, and here we find a fascinating context. The disciples have just experienced their last Passover with Jesus. They're in Jerusalem. They're nearing the end of his Passion Week. And Jesus institutes this Last Supper as a new ordinance. The bread is forever going to represent his body and the cup his blood. Judas the betrayer has exited. And now before they leave this room for the garden, Luke records some further conversations. And this is a most intimate setting in which a man who is about to die gathers his friends, his closest ones, and he talks to them. He shares his final words. And then a topic of universal importance and appeal emerges. And Jesus has something to say about this. This is Luke 22, verses 24 to 27. A dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And he said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as one who serves. For who is the greater, one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as the one who serves. As the disciples are clamoring for power and for prestige, the humble king gently confronts them. And so what is his message to them and to us? The message is that Jesus is our model for true greatness. It's not determined by how many serve you, but how you serve others. To be like Jesus means that we find greatness in serving. So this brief conversation is going to take us through four movements. The disciples dispute greatness. The world misuses greatness. Jesus defines greatness. And then Jesus models greatness for us. So let's begin with the disciples and their conflict over greatness. So verse 24 that we just read, a dispute arose among them 
as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. The disciples are engaged in a dispute. This word can be translated an argument or a contention. The Greek word is derived from the one that refers to a lover of quarrels. This is not something that's happening for the first time. It refers to an attitude or to a disposition. So losing their tempers at this point over who is the greatest is a bit shocking. Jesus enacting through the Passover meal that he's giving his blood and his body has seemed to uh, leave the disciples untouched. Reviewing the Gospels reveals that a significant theme for Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the disciples' ill-timed and self-centered grappling for greatness. In Luke 9, immediately after foretelling his death, we read that an argument started among them as to which was the greatest. Jesus responds by referencing children, and he says that the one who is least among them is to be the greatest. In Mark 10 and Matthew 20, directly after Jesus again gives details of his soon coming execution, James and John, along with their mother, boldly asked Jesus if they could sit at his right hand and his left hand in his kingdom. He answers them by reminding them that those who are to be first among them are to be their slaves. Now, in verse 24 there, I don't know if you noticed the word regarded. Well-chosen word can be translated as considered or seems. So who would seem the greatest? Who could be regarded as the greatest among us? It relates to how one desires to be perceived by other people. Well, it's easy to marvel at the blindness of the disciples and wonder how they could observe and reportedly hear about the self-sacrificial destiny of their master and still be bent on self-promotion. This competitive impulse to be superior is not just among the disciples. It appears to be a universal debate and pursuit. James, in the fourth chapter of his epistle, provides insight when he wrote this. What is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is its source not the pleasures that wage war in your members? Selfish desire leads us into conflict with one another. Nineteen centuries after the greatness was defined and modeled at the Last Supper, Napoleon scanned his cultural landscape and declared, In our time, no one has conception of what is great. It is up to me to show them. Jesus has something to say about us surrendering our fantasies of grandeur. Our conceptions of power and of greatness must be realigned according to the pattern that he has set. Rather than immediately responding with confrontation to the disciples' self-centered argument, Jesus directs their attention to popular conceptions of greatness. In verse 25 is the second movement that the world misuses greatness. He explains two objectionable qualities of secular leaders. And Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. The phrase lorded over means to exercise power over them, likely empower, uh, implying compulsion or oppression. The ancient world's notion was that the true use and exercise of superiority is to lord it over others, to use your power for selfish means. Remnants of this philosophy remain, remain with us today. I just wonder, as you have sat there and we're talking about greatness, what kind of images come to your mind from our culture? What do you think is a typical understanding of what makes a person great or what is greatness in an individual? Culturally, it seems to be tied to power, to control, the ability to exert one's will. It can be based in wealth, expertise, leadership ability, skills, or sheer will. Greatness seems to correspond to the capacity to make things happen, being in charge, to part the crowd when you come through. 
So it's not hard to see why greatness is born out of or can result in ambition, pride, and largeness of person. Great is the opposite of small. And so for some, proclaiming their greatness doesn't seem to be much of a struggle. Former world heavyweight boxing champion Muhammad Ali is famous or infamous for saying, I am the greatest. Well, just before takeoff on an airline flight, a stewardess was reminding Muhammad Ali that he needed to put his seatbelt on. And he said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. The stewardess then replied, Superman don't need no airplane. <laughs> so Muhammad buckled his seatbelt. <clears throat> Jesus also points out that those in authority are called benefactors. Now, benefactor was a title of honor. It was given in compensation for someone who was doing good deeds. <clears throat> Across the empire, taking the lead from the Roman emperor, the wealthy elite exercised generous benefaction. And rather than having to pay taxes, they contributed their time and their money to their town or to their villages. Their generosity gained them prestige in the community and reputations as deserving public office. So thus, only the wealthy could enjoy the honor and the self-advancement of leadership because it was reserved for those who gave generously. It is possible to detect a tone of satirical humor in Jesus' words. Kings exercise lordship, mastery, subjugation, through power, they subdue those under them, yet they're called benefactors, when often the person they're benefiting is themselves. So in a similar way, our motive can serve to serve others can be twisted towards selfish ends. So if we're honest with ourselves from time to time, though it's certainly not as bombastic as a wealthy Roman, we can subtly serve in order to be recognized seeking the reward of attention, basking in the appreciation of others rather than the reward of making someone else's life better. It turns out that Jesus himself is actually the true benefactor. The same verb form for benefactor, the same Greek word is used in Acts 10.38 where it says that Jesus went about doing good. The one who serves is the one who will receive that title of benefactor in his kingdom. The clearly corrupted use of greatness exposed by Jesus is a dis disordered desire to protect and advance one's dignity. Every person exists in the rarefied air of being made in the image of God. All the way back to our origins in Genesis 1:27, we read, so God created man in his image in the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them, and God blessed them. And so God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. Mankind inherently possesses the divine gift of nobility and glory. It is derived from our creator and can never surpass his infinite power and wisdom and goodness. Psalm 8 further establishes our standing. It says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. When I look at the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of man and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. God has set the sun and the moon in their place. And actually, once in a while, the moon passes in front of the sun for a few moments. An eerie darkness surrounds us. And it reminds us of his genius and his power that far surpasses ours. We marvel that as mankind, we can build a rocket that gets to the moon, yet he's the one who controls the movements of the moon with the precision of a cosmic clockmaker. 
In his kindness and mysterious purposes, the Lord has crowned humanity with glory and granted us power and authority in his creation. God gave us a tiny share in his greatness. We are formed in his image and not to be brought to shame. Yet since the fall, we are grasping for a greatness of our own making beyond the protective, loving bounds of his divine design. And we are prone to idolatry. Enamored with our capacity, our beauty, and our power, we essentially worship the creature rather than the creator, demanding that our greatness is from our own merit or derived from our own measures. Or we can descend into ugly competition, pushing to establish our greatness at the expense of others. The Lord has endowed us with dignity, splendor, and greatness. These are gifts to be respected and enjoyed with humility, acknowledge His supremacy and our finite limits. Now we turn to the third movement. Jesus defines greatness in verse 26. Jesus now turns His attention to those around the table who've been shamelessly stepping over each other to reach to the top rung, and He issues a simple penetrating rebuke, but not so with you. But not so with you. The you is emphatic here. It's placed at the beginning of the clause. Jesus wants his disciples to lead, but in a totally unconventional manner. The standards of his kingdom do not match the standards of the world. And Jesus reveals two radical points about true greatness. First of all, be content with the lower position of younger people and do not seek the veneration of the older. To the Eastern ancient mind, this was revolutionary. In Hebrew culture, there is a profound social and relational hierarchy based on age. The younger gave way to the older with honor, deference, and respect. And Jesus calls his followers to be like the youngest, regarding themselves and acting like the one who has the least power. The greatest is to become like the least. Second, Jesus declares that the leader is to be the one who serves. They're not to demand recognition and status, using their position for their own gain. Rather, they model servanthood, embracing personal sacrifice. And then Jesus provides uh, an illustration from common life for us. At a dinner or banquet, who is it, he asks, is considered the greater? Is it the person who's reclining at table? Or is the person who serve, who serves? Well, it's naturally the one who's reclining. They didn't sit in chairs, they reclined. So it's the one who's sitting at the table, not performing the menial tasks. This is the one who, pos- who possesses position or power or more resources at that time. The more people I have responding to my personal needs, doing for me what I want, the greater I'm considered to be. Well, Jesus flips this notion on its head. Greatness has a proper use to not only receive, but also to give. Being preeminent, honored, and powerful carries an obligation to serve. In his kingdom, power is to be used to help others, not to glorify oneself. The way to become great is to become small and to serve. In this, we can hear the echoes of other references in Luke to how we are to behave at meals. Seating arrangements at formal Jewish meals were very definite and they prescribed uh, in a way to reflect social standing. In our culture, uh, you can think of maybe going to a wedding reception, if you've been to those, and the wedding party and the parents and family and and other people are seated in particular spots. So even without ever speaking a word, when you walk into a wedding reception and you see where you're to sit, it says something about who you are in relationship to the wedding, uh, to the wedding party. In Luke 14, it's recorded that Jesus said, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him, and he who invited both of you will come and say to you, Give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. 
Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So we're to turn from securing and nurturing our status in in order to serve others. Jesus' words ring in our ears, but not so with you. And the key difference is our goal. Persons who lead like the Gentiles lead for their own benefit. Leading like Jesus means doing so for the good of someone else, using your position, using your platform in order to reach to other people. The benefits that you can claim for yourself are passed on to others. In the final sentence in our text, Jesus draws attention to himself and then completes this fourth fourth movement that Jesus models greatness. He says, but I am among you as the one who serves. He provides himself as the example of true greatness. The very night of this table conversation, Jesus gave his men a riveting illustration of his heart of service. Flipping their roles completely upside down, John records in chapter 13 of his gospel how Jesus the rabbi performed the socially socially unthinkable task of washing his pupils' feet. He is the Messiah, the divine Son of God, who just announced that he's initiating a new covenant. The one they called Master stooped to act like a slave. John 13, when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and it is right for you, for so am I. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. One commentator wrote, the disciples are interested in titles. Jesus offers them towels instead. For the kingdom will not be based on ruling, but on serving one another and doing it through love. Our Lord dignifies selfless service. We are to imitate his nobility in putting others first. The startling nature of Jesus' servanthood becomes increasingly incredulous when one considers it a little bit more. Luke 9 tells us about how Peter, James, and John got a brief glimpse of Jesus' glory when he was transfigured on a mountain and became radiant in his glory. And those men fell down and were terrified at the blinding glory of Jesus Christ. Later on the Isle of Patmos, John received a revelation of Jesus in his heavenly glory, and he fell on his face at Christ's feet, it says, as a dead man. Jesus rightly could have come in all of his kingly glory and his splendor, but instead he came to us veiled in his glory. Taking the form of a servant, as we read in Philippians 2, he humbled himself by being obedient, by obedient all the way to the death on a cross. Jesus became the genuine benefactor. He literally gave his life bestowing the benefits of salvation upon mankind. He implored the men whose feet he washed around that table, I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. And of course, Paul captures the same theme in Philippians 2, reminding them to have the mind of Christ in order to do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility of mind, consider others as more important than yourself. Let each of you not look only to your own personal interests, but also to the interests of others. Interestingly, there are some, some things that Jesus says uh, about greatness, and there's some things he doesn't say about greatness. He does not reject the notion of greatness. He recognizes its validity and how we are drawn to it. First of all, to the Lord's transcendent worthiness and then also to human greatness as an expression of the divine image. 
Clearly, people are not all exactly the same. There are immense differences among us in gifts and capacity, in desires and reach. An indicator of God's creativity and genius is the variety that fills his world. This includes each one of us. I mean, just, if you just take a look around here and just look at the differences that we have in size and in shape and in abilities and interests. Additionally, the Creator endowed mankind with an ability to distinguish, to discern differences, to evaluate, and to make value judgments. So combining the fact that we all have individual differences and with our natural propensity to assess and rank means that from childhood, you and I have instinctively, instinctively recognized who's the tallest, who's the strongest, who's the fastest, who's the smartest, who's the most skilled. So in gym classes and playgrounds and spelling bees, from GPAs and auditions, we've been acknowledging who's better and who's best and figuring out where each of us fits on the pecking order. And this is natural. There's no way around it. And Jesus doesn't expect us to deny our skills or our leadership or dismiss our greatness. But most importantly, it's not to be used as a means to self-promote and to leave others behind or underneath. The privilege of position is to pull others up. The Lord did not advocate a flattening of all human relationships, as if authority is inherently bad and power must be relinquished. The issue is how leadership is exercised. Christ's willingness to serve did not in any way rob him of his supreme authority. While choosing to be a servant, Jesus never lost or diminished his authority, his identity, and his being. He uniquely forgave sins, healed, taught, and revealed the Father, all while surrendering his rights and being a humble servant. The same principles work for us. Those who hold power, authority, or positions of strength don't lose their value or identity by serving. They also are not expected to necessarily surrender their leadership out of hand because of human weakness and mixed motives are in all of us. But followers of Christ who find themselves in leadership are required to use it as a platform for the good of others, moving in to rescue and to love and to care. As we seek to emulate Jesus' model of greatness, we recognize that in the spiritual life, motive is not inconsequential. Beyond being commanded, why would we choose a posture of, serve, of service? Because having been served by Christ, we are enlivened to care for others. We have been served by Christ, so we're enlivened to care for others. The true benefactor blesses us, and we're energized to gratefully serve him and others. It is hard to continue serving others if we ourselves do not allow ourselves to be served by Christ. The personal security, stability, and selflessness established and maintained by God's grace in Christ enables us to give our lives to others. It is the life of Jesus in us through the power of the Spirit that enables us to be like Him. Let's spend our remaining few moments considering some implications of this text. I read about a church in Santa Fe, New Mexico, that has only one door in and out of its worship center. And over that single door is a hand-lettered sign that reads, Servant's Entrance. There isn't any way in or out of the church other than being a person who goes through the service door. Jesus' call to action spills over into all of our lives. Let's consider the implications in three areas, the church, the world, and our homes. First of all, in the church. What does this mean for us? What are our relationships to be like here? Jesus told leaders to be servants. We just read that. So Peter tells us in chapter 5, verse 1 of his epistle, I exhort the elders among you, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, 
but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. Peter uses the same term that we found in Luke 22 about not lording over those in your charge. The biblical vision is a culture of servant-hearted humility that begins with the eldership, is passed to all the leaders, and then permeates the church body. As an elder and staff member, I rub shoulders uh, with the leaders of our church, with the elders, with the deacons, the staff, and and, uh, all the ministry leaders. And I'm grateful for the maturity and the godly lives and the sincere friendship that exists among these different groups. My family and I have been membered here at ZF uh, for 30 years, and I'm grateful and I'm impressed by how Jesus' servant mindset has stretched across the decades and the generations. And by God's grace, humble, joyful service for the Lord and for each other is something that I find really marks our church family. And if you're newer to ZF, I invite you uh, to join us uh, in being generous uh, and serving of each other. Second, there's implications in the world. What would it mean for you to show the true greatness of being a servant in your school or your workplace or in the community, places where you you serve and enjoy friendships, in your neighborhood? Outside of this church and and of your home, are you distinct in how you make others' lives better in small and larger ways? Are you known as someone who quietly steps in to deal with necessary tasks? Do those under your leadership feel secure and served? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus encouraged us, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. Lastly, our homes flourish in an atmosphere of unassuming mutual service. So the church, the broader community, and then moving to our homes. Let's start with parents. Entrusted with the authority to nurture and train their children, parents are reminded in Colossians 3.21, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. This is a warning to us as parents to not assume a position of lording our authority over our children, to be so exacting or severe or demanding, or harsh that you create a sense in your children that it's impossible for them to please you. And how about siblings in the home? So middle schoolers, high schoolers, college students, those in your early 20s, this is for you. Jesus is aware of the opportunity that you have with your siblings, especially those that are younger than you, for you to surprise them with your kindness. I have an older brother, two younger sisters. My wife and I have five children, ten grandchildren. So siblings can be thoughtless and insensitive. Family life can be full of those clawing in the competitive cauldron of limited attention and resources. Or family can be transformed by the beauty of do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but in humility of mind, consider others as more important than you. And let each not look after their own interests only, but also the interests of others. So, you have a sibling that you live with? I'd encourage you today just to consider how you can intentionally serve your brother or your sister in a small but meaningful way that you don't normally do. And why would you do that? Because Jesus serves you And as his disciple, he wants you to take the form of a servant with those whom you live with. Husbands and wives, marriage is designed to be a unique and precious relationship in which the greatness of service is lived out with trust, respect, and love. In fact, Ephesians 5 describes marriage as a picture of the relationship between Jesus and his church. Especially appropriate for this morning as we highlight Jesus as the model for eagerness to serve, is Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Men, 
those of us who are married, are called to a servant leadership like that of Jesus, who out of love gave himself up for his bride. Husbands, it doesn't take too long for us to learn that this kind of selfish life is impossible in our own strength. Without entrusting ourselves wholly to the saving work of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, we will fail to love as Jesus does. The stark and startling reality is that in some homes, oppression reigns rather than loving service. A growing body of literature and research, social awareness, and bold compassion are giving voice to those who are privately languishing under domineering, coercive behavior of a spouse. And God has led our church to be sensitive and responsive to these realities. You've probably heard of the Men of Peace growth groups that we have led, in which we educate and equip men to come alongside and to assist those in those situations. We have ZF members who are being trained as advocates for those who are being treated abusively. We actually have a domestic abuse response team that has been formed to help coordinate these efforts. So why would I, I mention this kind of delicate and troubling subject this morning? Well, it's because Jesus has something to say about that. Husbands, it's our responsibility to not lord over our wives, but to lovingly serve them as Jesus does his people. And so if this is an area in your life as a husband where you realize you've stepped over a line into a domineering spirit or tone or behaviors or coerciveness that you know does not honor the Lord, then reach out. Reach out to other men in your small group, to myself, to an elder, to staff members, and find a way to be able to reclaim that servant heart that Jesus has. Wives, if you're the recipient of domineering or coercive behavior, know that we're fostering a church culture here of protection and accountability. And we have among us those who are receiving help and healing, and they are prepared to come alongside others who are silently suffering. I know this is a heavy topic, but Jesus' command to be a community that serves demands that we care for one another in these ways. And this includes standing up for those who are mistreated and working with those who misuse their power. Well, as we close our time recalling Jesus' words, let's remember that Jesus Christ has inaugurated his kingdom and you are called to be great in it. Let's not force ourselves forward, arrogantly demanding our way over others, but also let's not shrink into the background, supposing that we're of little significance or value. Yours is a life of greatness to be modeled after the finest life ever lived. Jesus has shown us the path to greatness. And you, by faith, if you're a follower of his, possess a new nature in his likeness. The Holy Spirit empowers you to serve with joy and purpose. Jesus is our model of true greatness. It's not determined by how many serve you but by how you serve others. To be like Jesus means that we find greatness in serving. Well, we've all been on the path since childhood to establish our footing in this world, to find and distinguish ourselves. Well, when the smoke clears from all of your striving and it's time for you to be remembered and someone carves some woods, some words, in stone over your grave. May an appropriate epitaph be, I was among you as one who served, knowing that it brought joy to you to be selfless like Jesus. Lord Jesus, we honor you. We're amazed at the glory that you possess, that you humbled yourself to become a servant all the way to the point of your crucifixion. Um, we, we, can't, we can't do this. Our nature is to push ourselves um, to want to be better than others, to want to be appreciated, to be, get attention and recognize, uh, to have power in ways where we misuse that privilege. 
So Lord Jesus, come to each one of us individually, come to our homes, come to our friendships, into our conversations even, even today, and continue uh, to teach us uh, and to embolden us to be people who honor you and honor each other in our service. In Christ's name, amen.